Animals and birds live in communities. There is not an animal that lives on the earth, nor a being that flies on its wings, but forms part of communities like you. Al-Quran, chapter 6, verse 38. Research has shown that animals and birds live in communities, i.e. they organize and live and work together. Everything made in pairs. And of everything we have created pairs. Al-Quran, chapter 51, verse 49. This refers to things other than humans, animals, plants, and fruits. It may also be referring to a phenomenon like electricity in which the atoms consist of negatively and positively charged electrons and protons. Glory to Allah, who created and pairs all things that the earth produces, as well as their own humankind and other things of which they have no knowledge. Al-Quran, chapter 36, verse 36. The Quran here states that everything is created in pairs, including things that the humans do not know at the present and may discover later. Lifestyle and Communication of Ants Consider the following Quranic verse. And before Suleiman were marshaled his hosts of jinn and men and birds, and they were all kept in order and ranks. At length, when they came to a lowly valley of ants, one of the ants said, O ye ants, get into your habitations, lest Suleiman and his hosts crush you underfoot without knowing it. Al-Qur'an, chapter 27, verses 17 and 18. In the past, some people would have probably mocked the Qur'an, taking it to be a fairy tale book in which ants talk to each other and communicate sophisticated messages. In recent times, research has shown us several facts about the lifestyle of ants, which were not known earlier to mankind. Research has shown that the animals or insects whose lifestyle is closest in resemblance to the lifestyle of human beings are, in fact, the ants. This can be seen from the following findings regarding ants. A. The ants bury their dead in a manner similar to humans. B. They have a sophisticated system of division of labor, whereby they have managers, supervisors, foremen, workers, etc. C. Once in a while, they meet among themselves to have a chat. D. They have an advanced method of communication amongst themselves. E. They hold regular markets wherein they exchange goods. F. They store grains for long periods in winter, and if the grain begins to bud, they cut the roots, as if they understand that if they leave it to grow, it will rot. If the grains stored by them get wet due to rains, they take these grains out into the sunlight to dry, and once these grains are dry, they take them back inside as though they know that humidity will cause development of root systems and thereafter rotting of the grain. Barrier between sweet and salt waters. Consider the following Quranic verse. He has let free the two bodies of flowing water, meeting together. Between them is a barrier which they do not transgress. Al-Qur'an, chapter 55, verses 19 and 20. In the Arabic text, the word berzakh means a barrier or a partition. This barrier is not a physical partition. The Arabic word maraja literally means they both meet and mix with each other. Early commentators of the Qur'an were unable to explain the two opposite meanings for the two bodies of water, i.e. they meet and mix, and at the same time, there is a barrier between them. Modern science has discovered that in the places where two different seas meet, there is a barrier between them. This barrier divides the two seas so that each sea has its own temperature, salinity, and density. Oceanologists are now in a better position to explain this first. There is a slanted, unseen water barrier between the two seas through which water from one sea passes to the other. But when the water from one sea enters the other sea, it loses its distinctive characteristic and becomes homogenized with the other water. In a way, this barrier serves as a transitional homogenizing area for the two waters. The scientific phenomenon mentioned in the Qur'an was also confirmed by Dr. William Hay, who was a well-known marine scientist and professor of geological sciences at the University of Colorado. The Qur'an mentions this phenomenon also in the following verse. And made a separating bar between the two bodies of flowing water. Al-Qur'an, chapter 27, verse 61. This phenomenon occurs in several places, including the divider between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean at Gibraltar. But when the Qur'an speaks about the divider between fresh and salt water, it mentions the existence of a forbidding partition with the barrier. It is he who has let free the two bodies of flowing water, one palatable and sweet, and the other salty and bitter. 
yet he has made a barrier between them, and a partition that is forbidden to be passed. Al-Qur'an, chapter 25, verse 53. Modern science has discovered that in estuaries, where fresh, sweet, and salt water meet, the situation is somewhat different from that found in places where two seas meet. It has been discovered that what distinguishes fresh water from salt water in estuaries is a pinocline zone with a marked density discontinuity separating the two layers. This partition, or zone of separation, has salinity different from both the fresh water and the salt water. This phenomenon occurs in several places, including Egypt, where the River Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea. The Presence of Interstellar Matter Space outside organized astronomical systems was earlier assumed to be a vacuum. Astrophysicists later discovered the presence of bridges of matter in this interstellar space. These bridges of matter are called plasma and consist of completely ionized gas containing equal number of free electrons and positive ions. Plasma is sometimes called the fourth state of matter, besides the three known states of solid, liquid, and gas. The Qur'an mentions the presence of this interstellar material in the following verse. He who created the heavens and the earth and all that is in between. Al-Qur'an 25, 59. It would be ridiculous for anybody to even suggest that the presence of interstellar galactic material was known 1400 years ago. Fruits created in pairs, male and female. And fruit of every kind he made in pairs, two and two. Al-Qur'an, chapter 13, verse 3. Fruit is the end product of reproduction of the superior plants. The stage preceding fruit is the flower, which has male and female organs, or stamens and ovules. Once pollen has been carried to the flower, they bear fruit, which in turn matures and frees its seed. All fruits therefore imply the existence of male and female organs, a fact that is mentioned in the Qur'an. In certain species, fruit can come from non-fertilized flowers, Parthenocarpic fruit, like bananas, certain types of pineapple, fig, orange, vines, etc. They also have definite sexual characteristics. Blood circulation and the production of milk. Blood circulation and the production of milk. The Quran was revealed 600 years before the Muslim scientist Ibn Nafis described the circulation of blood and a thousand years before William Harvey brought this understanding to the Western world. Roughly 13 centuries before it was known what happens in the intestines to ensure that organs are nourished by the process of digestive absorption, a verse in the Qur'an described the source of the constituents of milk, in conformity with these notions. To understand the Qur'anic verse concerning the above concept, it is important to know that chemical reactions occur in the intestines and that from there, substances extracted from food pass into the bloodstream via a complex system, sometimes by way of the liver, depending on their chemical nature. The blood transports them to all organs of the body, among which are the milk-producing mammary glands. In simple terms, certain substances from the contents of the intestines enter into the vessels of the intestinal wall itself, and these substances are transported by the bloodstream to the various organs. This concept must be fully appreciated if we wish to understand the following verse in the Qur'an. And verily in cattle there is a lesson for you. We give you to drink of what is inside their bodies, coming from a conjunction between the contents of the intestine and the blood a milk pure and pleasant for those who drink it. Al-Qur'an, chapter 16, verse 66. And in cattle too, ye have an instructive example. From within their bodies, we produce milk for you to drink. There are in them, besides, numerous other benefits for you, and of their meat you eat. Al-Qur'an, chapter 23, verse 21. The Qur'anic description of the production of milk in cattle is strikingly similar to what modern physiology has discovered. A few years ago, a group of Arabs collected all information concerning embryology from the Qur'an and followed the instruction of the Qur'an which states, If you realize this not, ask of those who possess the message. Al-Qur'an, chapter 16, verse 43, and chapter 21, verse 7. All of the information from the Qur'an so gathered was translated into English and presented to Professor Keith Moore, who was a professor of embryology and chairman of the Department of Anatomy at the University of Toronto. At that time, he was one of the highest authorities in the field of embryology. He was asked to give his opinion regarding the information present in the Qur'an concerning the field of embryology. 
After carefully examining the translation of the Quranic verses presented to him, Dr. Moore said that most of the information concerning embryology mentioned in the Quran is in perfect conformity with modern discoveries in the field of embryology and does not conflict with them in any way. He added that there were, however, a few verses on whose scientific accuracy he could not comment. He could not say whether the statements were true or false, since he himself was not aware of the information contained therein. There was also no mention of this information in modern writings and studies on embryology. One such verse is, Proclaim, or read, in the name of thy Lord and Cherisher, who created, created man out of a mere clot of congealed blood. Al-Quran, chapter 96, verses 1-2. through two. The word alaq, besides meaning a congealed clot of blood, also means something that clings, or a leech-like substance. Dr. Keith Moore had no knowledge whether an embryo in the initial stages appears like a leech. To check this out, he studied the initial stage of the embryo under a very powerful microscope in his lab and compared what he observed with the diagram of a leech, and he was astonished at the striking resemblance between the two. In the same manner, he acquired more information on embryology that was hitherto not known to him from the Qur'an. Dr. Keith Moore answered about 80 questions dealing with embryological data mentioned in the Qur'an and Hadith. Noting that the information contained in the Qur'an and Hadith was in full agreement with the latest discoveries in the field of embryology, Professor Moore said, If I was asked these questions 30 years ago, I would not have been able to answer half of them for lack of scientific information. Dr. Keith Moore had earlier authored the book, The Developing Human. After acquiring new knowledge from the Qur'an, he wrote in 1982 the third edition of the same book, The Developing Human. The book was the recipient of an award for the best medical book written by a single author. This book has been translated into several major languages of the world and is used as a textbook of embryology in the first year of medical studies. In 1981, during the 7th Medical Conference in Dammam, Saudi Arabia, Dr. Moore said, It has been a great pleasure for me to help clarify statements in the Qur'an about human development. It is clear to me that these statements must have come to Muhammad from God or Allah, because almost all of this knowledge was not discovered until many centuries later. This proves to me that Muhammad must have been a messenger of Allah. Dr. Joe Lee Simpson, chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston proclaims, These hadiths, sayings of Muhammad peace be upon him, could not have been obtained on the basis of scientific knowledge that was available at the time of the writer. It follows that not only is there no conflict between genetics and religion, but in fact, religion, Islam, may guide science by adding revelation to some of the traditional scientific approaches. There exist statements in the Qur'an shown centuries later to be valid which support knowledge in the Qur'an having been derived from God. You know, people used to worship the sun. People used to worship the moon. People used to worship the stars. I'll tell you something so cool. It's totally not related to this lecture. It's a complete tangent, but I have to tell you because it's that cool. In about, about five years ago, they did an excavation of the city of Ur, U-R. The city is spelled U-R, ancient Babylonia, some parts of Iraq, outskirts of Iraq near Turkey somewhere. And they found a city buried about 50 feet under the ground, an ancient city. And their Bible scholars actually now agree, Jewish study scholars agree, that was the village of Abraham, Babylonia. And they found in that village thousands of idols. Thousands, small, big, action figure size, you know, regular size, two liter bottle size, and then like, you know, mega size, and then you have the super mega size, etc. All size of idols. Every household different idols. The Bible says they worshipped many idols. The Bible says what? They worshipped many idols. The Bible never says he saw the sun, he saw the moon, he saw the star. He doesn't, he doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that. By the way, Kaukab, Falamara Kaukaban, Kaukab in Arabic is actually Jupiter. So the Quran mentions that the Ibrahim alayhi salam pointed to the sun, he pointed to the moon, and he pointed to Jupiter. Okay? Now, when they dug these idols, how many idols did they find? What did I say? Thousands, thousands, but they only found three idols that were bigger than everybody else. There were three guys, three giant men, idols. One guy, his head was shaped like Starbucks, like the sun. One guy, his head was a crescent moon. And one guy was a planet with rings around it, which is what? Jupiter. So they now think that the three main gods of that society were the sun god and the moon god and Jupiter. 
The Bible never said anything about this. What did? Quran did. The Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam, instead of attacking all the idols, when he demonstrated the sun, the moon, and, the, and Jupiter, he, he went after the biggest ones. Subhanallah. Anyway, that was the cool thing I wanted to share with you on the side. Consider the following Quranic verse. Verily we created man from a drop of mingled sperm. Al-Quran, chapter 76, verse 2. The Arabic word nutfatin amshajin means mingled liquids. According to some commentators of the Qur'an, mingled liquids refer to the male or female agents or liquids. After mixture of male and female gamete, the zygote still remained nutfa. Mingled liquids can also refer to spermatic fluid that is formed of various secretions that come from various glands. Therefore, nutfatin amshaj, i.e. a minute quantity of mingled liquids, refers to the male and female gametes, or germinal fluids or cells, as part of the surrounding fluids. Sex Determination The sex of a fetus is determined by the nature of the sperm and not the ovum. The sex of the child, whether male or female, depends on whether the 23rd pair of chromosomes is XX or XY, respectively. Primarily, sex determination occurs at fertilization and depends upon the type of sex chromosome in the sperm that fertilizes an ovum. If it is an X-bearing sperm that fertilizes the ovum, the fetus is a female, and if it is a Y-bearing sperm, then the fetus is a male that he did create in pairs, male and female, from a seed when lodged in its place. Al-Qur'an, chapter 53, verses 45 and 46. The Arabic word nutfa means a minute quantity of liquid and tumna means ejaculated or planted. Therefore, nutfa specifically refers to a sperm because it is ejaculated. The Qur'an says, Was he not a drop of sperm emitted in lowly form? Then did he become a clinging clot? Then did Allah make and fashion him in due proportion. And of him he made two sexes, male and female. Al-Quran, chapter 75, verse 37 through 39. Here again it is mentioned that a small quantity or drop of sperm, indicated by the word nutfata mimmaniyin, which comes from man, is responsible for the sex of the fetus. Mothers-in-law in the Indian subcontinent by and large prefer having male grandchildren and often blame their daughters-in-law if the child is not of the desired sex. If only they knew that the determining factor is the nature of the male sperm and not the female ovum. If they were to blame anybody, they should blame their sons and not their daughters-in-law since both the Qur'an and science hold that it is the male fluid that is responsible for the sex of a child. We start with the earth. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِهَادَ And then وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادَ The mountains on top of it is pegs. The earth, Qur'an describes, shifts. And the mountain puts it in place. Holds it together. Now, the earth in Arabic is feminine, and the mountain is masculine. And the earth is also, it, the earth also gives birth. That's why it's called mihada too. Mahad is the cradle of a mother. And men are described as support, supporters of family and stability and tamkeen and, you know, sakina, etc., etc., right? First Allah describes that the earth and mountain are married. And immediately he says, men and women are married. وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja. Isn't that beautiful? Let's stick with that first one. The earth and the mountain are paired together. Think of it visually. A huge patch of land, and the most prominent thing is what? The mountains. If you go to the end of this passage, you see a huge sky. And the most prominent thing in that sky is what? The sun. So he starts with that, the large landscape, and then the thing that sticks out, and he ends with the large skyscape, and the one thing that sticks out. That's how the passage begins and ends. Pair and pair. The second thing he mentioned, was that he created man and woman in pairs. If we go in reverse, backwards, he mentions, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ libasa وَجَعَلْنَا nahara ma'asha. He made the night a garment, a covering. And he made the day a means of earning a living. And by the way, on the one hand he said, man and woman. And on the other hand, he compared them to night and day. Which is very, it's truly amazing. Other places in the Qur'an, Allah will say, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى The night. وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى The day. وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى And how marvelously he created the male and the female. Darkness in the depths of the ocean. 
Professor Durga Rao is an expert in the field of marine geology and was a professor at King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. He was asked to comment on the following verse. Or the unbeliever state is like the depths of darkness in a vast deep ocean, overwhelmed with billow topped by billow topped by dark clouds, depths of darkness one above another. If a man stretches out his hand, he can hardly see it. For any to whom Allah giveth not light, there is no light. Al-Quran Chapter 24, verse 40. Professor Rao said that scientists have only now been able to confirm, with the help of modern equipment, that there is darkness in the depths of the ocean. Humans aren't unable to dive unaided underwater for more than 20 to 30 meters and cannot survive in the deep oceanic regions at a depth of more than 200 meters. This verse does not refer to all seas because not every sea can be described as having accumulated darkness layered over one another. It refers especially to a deep sea or deep ocean, as the Qur'an says, darkness in a vast deep ocean. This layered darkness is a deep ocean, is a result of two causes. Number one, a light ray is composed of seven colors. These seven colors are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, or roji biv. The light ray undergoes refraction when it hits water. The upper 10 to 15 meters of water absorb the red color. Therefore, if a diver is 25 meters underwater and gets wounded, he would not be able to see the red color of his blood because the red color does not reach this depth. Similarly, orange rays are absorbed at 30 to 50 meters, yellow at 50 to 100 meters, green at 100 to 200 meters, and finally, blue beyond 200 meters and violet and indigo above 200 meters. Due to successive disappearance of color, one layer after another, the ocean progressively becomes darker, i.e. darkness takes place in layers of light. Below a depth of a thousand meters, there is complete darkness. Number two, the sun's rays are absorbed by clouds, which in turn scatter light rays, thus causing a layer of darkness under the clouds. This is the first layer of darkness. When light rays reach the surface of the ocean, they are reflected by the wave surface, giving it a shiny appearance. Therefore, it is the waves which reflect light and cause darkness. The unreflected light penetrates into the depths of the ocean. Therefore, the ocean has two parts. The surface characterized by light and warmth, and the depth characterized by darkness. The surface is further separated from the deep part of the ocean by waves. The internal waves cover the deep waters of seas and oceans because the deep waters have a higher density than the waters above them. The darkness begins below the internal waves. Even the fish in the depths of the ocean cannot see. Their only source of light is from their own bodies. The Qur'an rightly mentions, Darkness in a vast deep ocean, overwhelmed with waves, looped by waves. In other words, above these waves are more types of waves, i.e. those found on the surface of the ocean. The Qur'anic verse continues to say, Topped by dark clouds, depths of darkness, one above another. These clouds, as explained, are barriers, one over the other, that further causes darkness by absorption of colors at different levels. Professor Durga Rao concluded by saying, 1400 years ago, a normal human being could not even explain this phenomenon in so much detail. Thus, the information must have come from a supernatural source. Mountains are like pegs. In geology, the phenomenon of folding is a recently discovered fact. Folding is responsible for the formation of mountain ranges. The Earth's crust, on which we live, is like a solid shell, while the deeper layers are hot and fluid, and thus inhospitable to any form of life. It is also known that the stability of the mountains is linked to the phenomenon of folding, for it was the folds that were to provide the foundations for the reliefs that constitute the mountains. Geologists tell us that the radius of the Earth is about 3,750 miles, and the crust on which we live is very thin, ranging between 1 and 30 miles. Since the crust is thin, it has a high possibility of shaking. Mountains act like stakes or tent pegs that hold the Earth's crust and give it stability. The Qur'an contains exactly such a description in the following verse. Have we not made the Earth as a wide expanse and the mountains as pegs? Al-Qur'an, chapter 78, verses 6 and 7. The word awted means stakes or pegs, like those used to anchor a tent, and they are the deep foundations of geological folds. A book named Earth is considered as a basic reference textbook on geology in many universities around the world. One of the authors of this book is Frank Press, 
who was the president of the Academy of Sciences in the USA for 12 years and was a science advisor to former U.S. President Jimmy Carter. In this book, he illustrates the mountain in a wedge shape and the mountain itself as a small part of the whole, whose root is deeply entrenched in the ground. According to Dr. Press, the mountains play an important role in stabilizing the crust of the earth. The Qur'an clearly mentions the function of the mountains in preventing the earth from shaking. And we have set on the earth mountains standing firm, lest it should shake with them. Al-Qur'an, chapter 21, verse 31. The Qur'anic descriptions are perfect agreement with modern geological data. Mountains firmly fixed. The surface of the earth is broken into many rigid plates that are about 100 kilometers in thickness. These plates flow on a partially molten region called a sthenosphere. Mountain formations occur at the boundary of the plates. The earth's crust is 5 kilometers thick below oceans, about 35 kilometers thick below flat continental surfaces, and almost 80 kilometers thick below great mountain ranges. These are the strong foundations on which mountains stand. The Qur'an also speaks about the strong mountain foundations in the following verse. And the mountains hath he firmly fixed. Al-Qur'an, chapter 79, verse 32. Human beings created from nutfa, or minute quantity of liquid. The glorious Qur'an mentions no less than 11 times that the human being is created from nutfa, which means a minute quantity of liquid or a trickle of liquid which remains after emptying a cup. This is mentioned in several verses of the Qur'an, including chapters 22, verse 5, and chapter 23, verse 13. Science has confirmed in recent times that only one out of an average of three million sperms is required for fertilizing the ovum. This means that only a one to three millionth part, or 0.00003% of the quantity of sperms that are emitted is required for fertilization. In 1925, an American astronomer by the name of Edwin Hubble provided observational evidence that all galaxies are receding from one another, which implies that the universe is expanding. The expansion of the universe is now an established scientific fact. This is what Al-Qur'an says regarding the nature of the universe. With the power and skill did we construct the firmament, for it is we who create the vastness of space. Al-Qur'an 51:47. The Arabic word musirun is correctly translated as expanding it, and it refers to the creation of the expanding vastness of the universe. Stephen Hawking in his book A Brief History of Time says, The discovery that the universe is expanding was one of the great intellectual revolutions of the 20th century. The Qur'an mentioned the expansion of the universe before even man learned how to build a telescope. Honey has healing properties. The bee assimilates juices of various kinds of flowers and fruit and forms within its body the honey, which it stores in its cells of wax. Only a couple of centuries ago, man came to know that honey comes from the belly of the bee. This fact was mentioned in the Qur'an 1400 years ago in the following verse. There issues from within their bodies a drink of varying colors, wherein is healing for men. Al-Qur'an chapter 16 verse 69. We are now aware that honey has a healing property and also a mild antiseptic property. The Russians used honey to cover their wounds in World War II. The wound would retain moisture and would leave very little scar tissue. Due to the density of honey, no fungus or bacteria would grow in the wound. A person suffering from an allergy of a particular plant may be given honey from that plant so that the person develops resistance to that allergy. Honey is rich in fructose and vitamin K. Thus, the knowledge contained in the Qur'an regarding honey, its origin and properties, was far ahead of the time it was revealed. Every living thing is made of water. Consider the following Qur'anic verse. Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together as one unit of creation before we clove them asunder? We made from water every living thing. Will they not then believe? Al-Qur'an chapter 21 verse 30. Only after advances have been made in science do we now know that cytoplasm, the basic substance of the cell, is made up of 80% water. Modern research has also revealed that most organisms consist of 50-90% to water and that every living entity requires water for its existence. Was it possible 14 centuries ago for any human being to guess that every living being was made of water? Moreover, would such a guess be conceivable by a human being in the deserts of Arabia where there has always been scarcity of water? The following verse refers to the creation of animals from water. 
And Allah has created every animal from water. Al-Qur'an, chapter 24, verse 45. The following verse refers to the creation of human beings from water. It is he who has created man from water. Then has he established relationships of lineage and marriage. For thy Lord has power over all things. Al-Qur'an, chapter 25, verse 54. Plants created in pairs, male and female. Previously, humans did not know that plants, too, have male and female gender distinctions. Botany states that every plant has a male and female gender. Even the plants that are unisexual have distinct elements of both male and female. And he has sent down water from the sky. With it, we have produced diverse pairs of plants, each separate from the others. Al-Qur'an, chapter 20, verse 53. Human beings created from sulala, or quintessence of liquid and made his progeny from a quintessence of the nature of a fluid despised. Al-Qur'an, chapter 32, verse 8. The Arabic word sulala means quintessence or the best part of a whole. We have come to know now that only one single spermatozoon that penetrates the ovum is required for fertilization, out of the several millions produced by man. That one spermatozoon out of several millions is referred in the Qur'an as sulala. Sulala also means gentle extraction from a fluid. The fluid refers to both male and female germinal fluids containing gametes. Both ovum and sperm are gently extracted from their environments in the process of fertilization. The bee. And thy Lord taught the bee to build its cells in hills, on trees, and in men's habitations, then to eat of all the produce of the earth, and find with skill the spacious paths of its Lord. Al-Qur'an, chapter 16, verses 68 through 69. Von Frisch received the Nobel Prize in 1973 for his research on the behavior and communication of bees. The bee, after discovering any new garden or flower, goes back and tells its fellow bees the exact direction and map to get there, which is known as bee dance. The meanings of this insect's movements that are intended to transmit information between worker bees have been discovered scientifically using photography and other methods. The Qur'an mentions in the above verse how the bee finds with skill the spacious paths of its lord. The worker bee, or the soldier bee, is actually a female bee. In Surah An-Nahl, chapter 16, verses 68 through 69, the gender used for the bee is the female gender, Fasluki and Kuli, indicating that the bee that leaves its home for gathering food is a female bee. In other words, the soldier or worker bee is a female bee. In fact, in Shakespeare's play Henry IV, some of the characters speak about bees and mention that the bees are soldiers and that they have a king. That is what people thought in Shakespearean times. They thought that the worker bees are male bees and that they go home and are answerable to a king bee. This, however, is not true. The worker bees are females and they do not report to a king bee but to a queen bee. But it took modern investigations in the last 300 years to discover this. Winds impregnate the clouds. And we send the fecundating winds, then cause the rain to descend from the sky therewith providing you with water in abundance. Al-Qur'an, chapter 15, verse 22. The Arabic word used here is lawaqih, which is the plural of laqih from laqaha, which means to impregnate or fecundate. In this context, impregnate means that the wind pushes the clouds together, increasing the condensation that causes lightning and thus rain. A similar description is found in the Qur'an. It is Allah who sends the winds, and they raise the clouds. Then does he spread them in the sky as he wills and break them into fragments, until thou seest raindrops issue from the midst thereof. Then when he has made them such of his servants as he wills, behold, they do rejoice. Al-Qur'an, chapter 30, verse 48. The Qur'anic descriptions are absolutely accurate and agree perfectly with modern data on hydrology. The sun will extinguish after a certain period. The light of the sun is due to a chemical process on its surface that has been taking place continuously for the past 5 billion years. It will come to an end at some point of time in the future when the sun will be totally extinguished, leading to the extinction of all life on earth. Regarding the impermanence of the sun's existence, the Qur'an says, And the sun runs its course for a period determined for it. That is the decree of him, the exalted in might, the all-knowing. Al-Qur'an 36-38 The Arabic word used here is mustaqar, 
which means a place of time that is determined. Thus the Qur'an says that the sun runs towards a determined place and will do so only up to a predetermined period of time, meaning that it will end or extinguish. This is Iman Haggag recording Spider's Web or Home is Fragile. The Qur'an mentions in Surah Al-Ankabut, the parable of those who take protectors other than Allah is that of the spider who builds to itself a house, but truly the flimsiest of houses is the spider's house, if but they knew. Al-Qur'an chapter 29 verse 41. Besides giving the physical description of the spider's web as being very flimsy, delicate, and weak, the Qur'an also stresses on the flimsiness of the relationship in the spider's house, where the female spider many times kills its mate, the male spider. For a long time, European philosophers and scientists believed that the earth stood still in the center of the universe and every other body, including the sun, moved around it. In the West, this geocentric concept of the universe was prevalent right from the time of Ptolemy in the 2nd century BC. In 1512, Nicholas Copernicus put forward his heliocentric theory of planetary motion, which asserted that the sun is motionless at the center of the solar system with the planets revolving around it. In 1609, the German scientist Johannes Kepler published the Astronomia Nova. In this piece, he concluded that not only do the planets move in elliptical orbits around the sun, they also rotate upon their axes at irregular speeds. With this knowledge, it became possible for European scientists to explain correctly many of the mechanisms of the solar system, including the sequence of night and day. After these discoveries, it was thought that the sun was stationary and did not rotate about its axis like the Earth. I remember having studied this fallacy from geography books during my school days. Consider the following Qur'anic verse. It is he who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon. All the celestial bodies swim along, each in its rounded course. Al-Qur'an 21.33 The Arabic word used in the above verse is yasbahun. The word yasbahun is derived from the word sabaha. It carries with it the idea of motion that comes from any moving body. If you use the word for a man on the ground, it would not mean that he is rolling, but would mean he is walking or running. If you use the word for a man in water, it would not mean that he is floating, but would mean that he is swimming. Similarly, if you use the word yasbah for a celestial body such as the sun, it would not mean that it is only flying through space, but would rather mean that it is also rotating as it goes through space. Most of the school textbooks have incorporated the fact that the sun rotates about its axis. The rotation of the sun about its own axis can be proved with the help of an equipment that projects the image of the sun on the tabletop so that one can examine the image of the sun without being blinded. It is noticed that the sun has spots which complete a circular motion once every 25 days, i.e. the sun takes approximately 25 days to rotate around its axis. In fact, the sun travels through space at roughly 150 miles per second and takes about 200 million years to complete one revolution around the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It is not permitted to the sun to catch up to the moon, nor can the night outstrip the day. Each just swims along in its own orbit, according to law. Al-Qur'an 3640 The above verse mentions an essential fact discovered by modern astronomy, i.e. the existence of the individual orbits of the sun and the moon and their journey through space with their own motion. The fixed place towards which the sun travels, carrying with it the solar system, has been located exactly by modern astronomy. It has been given a name, the solar apex. The solar system is indeed moving in space towards a point situated in the constellation of Hercules, the alpha layer, whose exact location is firmly established. The moon rotates around its axis in the same duration that it takes to revolve around the Earth. It takes approximately 29 and a half days to complete one rotation. One cannot help but be amazed at the scientific accuracy of the Qur'an. The Existence of Subatomic Particles In ancient times, a well-known theory by the name of theory of atomism was widely accepted. This theory was originally proposed by the Greeks, in particular a man named Democritus, who lived about 23 centuries ago. Democritus and the people that came after him assumed that the smallest unit of matter was the atom. The Arabs used to believe the same. The Arabic word dharra is most commonly meant an atom. In recent times, modern science has discovered that it is possible to split even an atom, 
That the atom can be split further is a development of the 20th century. 14 centuries ago, this concept would have appeared unusual, even to an Arab. For him, the dharra was the limit beyond one could not go. The following Quranic verse, however, refuses to acknowledge this limit. The unbelievers say, Never to us will come the hour, say, Nay, but most surely by my Lord, it will come upon you, by him who knows the unseen, from whom is not hidden the least little atom in the heavens or on earth, nor is there anything less than that, or greater, but is in the record perspicuous. Al-Quran, chapter 34, verse 3. This verse refers to the omniscience of God, his knowledge of all things, hidden or apparent. It then goes further and says that God is aware of everything, including what is smaller or bigger than the atom. Thus, the verse clearly shows that it is possible for something smaller than the atom to exist, a fact only discovered recently by modern science. The Flight of the Birds Regarding the flight of birds, the Qur'an says, do they not look at the birds, held poised in the midst of the air and the sky? Nothing holds them up but the power of Allah. Verily in this are signs for those who believe. Al-Qur'an, chapter 16, verse 79. A similar message is repeated in the Qur'an in the verse, Do they not observe the birds above them, spreading their wings and folding them in? None can uphold them except Allah most gracious. Truly it is He that watches over all things. Al-Qur'an, chapter 67, verse 19. The Arabic word emsaka literally means to put one's hand on, seize, hold, hold someone back, which expresses the idea that Allah holds the bird up in his power. These verses stress the extremely close dependence of the bird's behavior on divine order. Modern scientific data has shown the degree of perfection attained by certain species of birds with regard to the programming of their movements. It is only the existence of a migratory program in the genetic code of the birds that can explain the long and complicated journey that very young birds, without any prior experience and without any guide, are able to accomplish. They are also able to return to the departure point on a definite date. Professor Hamburger in his book Power and Fragility gives the example of a mutton bird that lives in the Pacific with its journey of over 15,000 miles in the shape of a figure eight. It makes this journey over a period of six months and comes back to its departure point with a maximum delay of one week. The highly complicated instructions for such a journey have to be contained in the bird's nervous cells. They are definitely programmed. Should we not reflect on the identity of this programmer? <laughs>